All right. Hey, all. We're here to talk about money and politics. I'm Ken Vogel, reporter for the New York Times. I cover the confluence of money and politics. And uh, I'm joined by Julie Bikowitz and Sheila Krummel, Julie from the Wall Street Journal, and Sheila from the Center for Responsive Politics, to give you guys hopefully a few pointers for approaching uh, money and politics and incorporating money and politics into your coverage. Because I think a lot of people hear about Federal Election Commission reports or uh, you know, see horse race coverage of who's raised the most money and how much money has come from small donors and their eyes kind of glaze over. And so hopefully what we will be able to impart upon you in this session is that money in politics is more than just about the horse race and it's more than just about who's spending the most on TV time or consultants. So certainly all of that is part of it. It's also a really important tool um, for your reporting that you can incorporate into any number of stories on any number of subjects during the campaign, after the campaign, when the folks who you were just covering are in office, to be able to add some texture and context to show your listeners or readers or viewers kind of what's happening behind the decisions. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Sheila is uh, at the Center for Responsive Politics, which is a great resource, a, a great starting point for any number of those types of uh, stories, both during the campaign and then after the campaign, not just campaign money, which is mostly what we're here to talk about today, but also dark money, lobbying money, foreign lobbying money. You know, there are tricks to use to, that, you, that you can use at a sort of more advanced level to probe any of those given areas, but the Center for Responsive Politics and their website is a great starting point to get an overview on all of those subjects and then some. So without further ado, I'll pass the, pass the mic to Sheila. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, I am going to uh, tell you a little bit about the Center for Responsive Politics and our website, Open Secrets, and then walk through a lot of slides. I'm, I hope this isn't death by PowerPoint, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, so uh, I lead the Center for Responsive Politics. Just to be clear, we are not a campaign finance reform organization. We don't take any position, for instance, on um, Citizens United. We're a campaign finance research organization. We do advocate for transparency. We feel like we can't do our job. Press can't do your job. Voters uh, can't, can't um, uh, participate in democracy effectively if they don't have access to information. So for us, that's just really basic. We field questions from reporters all day, every day. So if you have any questions about what you see on our site, on the FEC site, what the difference is, give us a call. Uh, tomorrow, our research director who lives here, Sarah Breiner, will be here. Uh, so I hope you get a chance to connect with her. Uh, she's a font of wisdom about money and politics and lots of other things. And um, we also create custom research for data. So if you see something on our site, but it's not quite what you're looking for, or you want a longer list, you want the detail behind the summary, give us a call and we'll shoot that to you. We want you to see what we have uh, aggregated so that you can see for yourselves what's included and whether it's what you would have uh, done or whether it's accurate. Quarterly filings, of course, are due on Monday. We will uh, be cherry picking uh, to look for what's interesting along with you, but we'll be updating our summary numbers immediately uh, by the next morning uh, for all candidates and adding value to kind of the rest of the uh, website. Big night days. for campaign finance nerds, the first yeah. big quarterly filing of the presidential cycle. There are going to be several stories filed at 2 a.m. Uh, <laughs> that morning. And I'm going to show you some core resources on uh, open secrets and talk about a few things to keep in mind uh, as you're mining the data for stories. Um, but for so that'll cover um, campaign donations. And it's really important to know kind of what the difference is between us and FEC. We add value to the data. I, th I always think of ourselves as kind of an adjunct to the Federal Election Commission because they make it, their website is awesome now. I mean, it's much better. Um, but they make it all available. We grab it and we do a lot to the data. We code it by industry. We standardize it by organization. We disambiguate individual donations. And so that we can aggregate all the various ways that a name is standardized or misspelled. Um, so we do a lot to the donations. We also track expenditures and do the same thing. We categorize them by type of expenditure, 
Uh, so you can see how much is spent on fundraising versus media. We standardize them by vendor. So you see who is being used by the candidates and their single candidate super PACs uh, and make those connections. Um, you can see trends over time. We've been doing this since, uh, well, we were founded in 83, but we've been doing this uh, for at least a couple decades. So you have a good sense of what is normal and what anomalies really leap out at you. And um, we, of course, also track outside spending. So super PACs, dark money, uh, non-disclosing nonprofits, shell corps, and increasingly now gray money, uh, partially disclosing groups. Political ad data, we have the FEC, FCC ad data up on our site, um, which you can uh, uh, search. We're also working to incorporate the, well, we and everybody else, we're working with a number of universities, are working to incorporate the online political ad data. Uh, and that's exciting. There will be major improvements on that uh, for exposing that data this year. Uh, as Ken said, lobbying and foreign lobbying. Today was a great, there was a great story on the Nigerian politician known for allegedly demanding $500,000 from uh, ex-Congressman Jefferson, the one who stashed $90,000 in his freezer. Uh, he lost a presidential bid, but is lobbying the US to be essentially the Guaido of Nigeria, the Nigeria's authentic president. Uh, and he called us fake news for saying so, but uh, a fact checking News organization said, in fact, our work is accurate. So we're happy about that. We also track the revolving door and personal finances of members. Um, so let's just uh, leap into it uh, uh, with our data. So uh, we track, we, each cycle we say, well, how much was spent this cycle and is it going up or down? It's only always ever going up. And this cycle is going way up. As you can see, $5.7 billion spent in 2018 I think uh, the trends that led to that jump in 18 are likely to continue, and we're, uh, I, I hate, I'm not supposed to make predictions, but I think a $7 million presidential election cycle is uh, conservative at this point. Uh, you will billions. sometimes see, what? Billion. Billion, rather. Did I say million? Yes, billions, we're talking billion, millions, billions. So, uh, $5.7 billion last cycle, $7 billion, uh, almost certainly in, in uh, 2020. You will sometimes see different figures coming from the FEC because they are tracking all the money that they are, they're counting all the money they're tracking, which includes some double counting. So what we're doing is uh, backing that out. So this should be uh, uh, the, the, the final figure. Um, Presidential, this just gives you the, the scope with presidential versus midterm elections. So you see the kind of two steps forward, one step back. So who cares if it's five billion or 500 billion? What does that matter? What does it mean? Billions of dollars are just kind of funny money. Well, here's what it means. If you yourself are one, running uh, in Congress, you need on average two million in the House now, 15.7 million in the Senate to run a winning Senate, a winning campaign. Uh, and where are you going to get that money? If you uh, uh, are like most Americans, you won't. You can't, unless you swim in those circles already. Uh, where did the money come from? Well, as you can see with the yellow uh, chunk of the pie, it's coming from large individual donors, those giving more than $200. There's a lot of talk now about the growth in small donations, that it has grown, it is true. But those giving uh, more than $200 are still giving most of the money. And uh, there was a huge increase in those maxing out. So 93,000 donors gave the maximum amount of money to candidates in, in the last cycle, the biggest uh, amount since 2002. So a pretty big leap. Uh, the blue chunk is, uh, the blue slice of the pie is PACs, which has um, been kind of stagnant. And uh, where does that come from in terms of individuals? A very tiny elite set of Americans, less than one half of 1% of Americans deliver more than 70% of the individual donations. Uh, where does the money come from for House uh, Democrats versus Republicans? Again, uh, the green slice is large individual donations. More money is coming from small donations for Democrats last cycle. More uh, for Republicans is coming from PACs. And in the Senate, it's about the same. Again, relying, depending mostly on those large individual donations with um, an even larger percentage of small donations going to, to Democrats and PAC donations going to the Senate. Um, 
In terms of industry, again, we classify it by industry and interest groups. So you can see business at the macro level, business is the primary source. Um, yes, it's kind of overinflated because everybody works for every, for everybody works, most people work somewhere, unless you're not employed. Um, but what we see in the data is that these are titans of industry. These are not your average kind of rank and file Americans delivering uh, itemized donations of more than $200 to campaigns. Uh, that is kind of an unnatural act for most Americans. And as you see at the bottom line, the yellow line, uh, labor money is, is pretty flat line in 2018. Uh, cycle after cycle, Wall Street is the top industry delivering this campaign cash. Finance is the major sector, and then within that, securities and investment. Our term for Wall Street is the top industry uh, for candidates, PACs, and parties, leadership PACs and parties. Uh, and where is it coming from geographically? Uh, usually, DC and New York are competing for the number one and two slots. San Francisco has crept up the list now and is number <coughs> three. Um, they weren't even on the top 10 list uh, years ago. And Chicago is held steady at four. So these are the kind of the places that candidates uh, make sure to hit to rake up uh, the big, do big dollars at fundraisers. Uh, Ken, your beloved Philadelphia has I dropped know, in the list. It's, yeah. it's, it's fallen down. Still on the list, though. Still we call the these uh, political ATMs. <laughs> so, like, you, it's actually good. You like figure out who are the major donors in a given city on either side of the aisle, and you know if a candidate is swinging through there. If you have sources who can like help you, either the donors themselves or people around the donors, it's a good way to sort of tell the story in real time, even before these reports come out. Sorry, interrupted yeah. you. No, that's great. Um, OK, so here we're looking at outside spending disclosure by election. Obviously, dark money remains a, a, a big source of cash, but it's actually dropped in 2018. And what has taken its place is that uh, second to the bottom gray bar of partially disclosing or gray money groups, which um, I think there's an interesting story there. My own view is that it allows a group to give a menu of options to donors. So if you don't mind the press scrutiny, you can disclose. We'll you know, take it through the super PAC. Um, if you don't want that uh, public attention and you want to fly under the radar, uh, you can give to the C4 or the C6 uh, non-disclosing nonprofit, which might give it then to the super PAC. Uh, but we look at at how much of those donations, even going to disclosing super PACs, are actually revealing the original source of the money. So that's what you're seeing here, is that's a big spike in 2018 by these partially disclosing groups. In fact, um, all told, nearly $540 million uh, last cycle was spent by groups that do not fully disclose their donors, which is a record for non-presidential years. Um, spending by viewpoint, where is the money coming from? in terms of uh, liberal versus conservative groups. Well, here's a rather who's spending it. In 2010 through 16, it was 70 to 90% conservative uh, organizations that were raising and spending this money. In 2018, uh, the liberal groups flipped it and they became the top spending um, groups uh, for dark money. Uh, and Majority Forward was the number one dark money spender uh, a group that is connected to current and former um, Democratic Senate leaders, spending about $46 million on its own. We also started this uh, great new project tracking the race uh, and gender of federal candidates for 2018. We're now doing the work to compile this research for 2020. Um, we were surprised to find that there was no single credible source of self-reported race for federal candidates. So that's what we set out to do, and we've now compiled that data. And what you see here, for instance, in this new uh, data set, uh, which is highly interactive, and, and I hope you'll all go check it out, uh, is how little money, for instance, when just selecting for PACs, how little money uh, black candidates have been able to raise as compared to uh, the other candidates is particular in so black candidates in blue and uh, white candidates uh, it, it re is represented in the red bar important to look at the count of candidates because these are averages but um, this is a I think a helpful new tool given how diverse this new Congress is and, and a trend we're likely to see continue um, of course more money is coming from women uh, to support many of these uh, new uh, women 
candidates running, and uh, three quarters of that money is going to Democrats. Uh, and 90% and of the uh, people of color in Congress are Democrats. So uh, this is uh, a highly diverse uh, Congress, but uh, leaning to one party. Uh, here, you just quickly see at a glance, uh, the light blue bar is um, uh, Democratic women climbing. The dark blue bar is Democratic men dropping. And Republican <clears throat> men, uh, the number of Republican men running uh, drops as well. Republican women flatlining at the bottom. So that is my quick uh, run through of some key data sets that we track on our website. I did want to also mention a couple quick things. Um, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to save them for later because it might come up after you guys talk. All right. And let me uh, introduce Julie Bikowitz because I want to make sure that I'm giving her the hype that she deserves. I'm a huge <laughs> fan. She's uh, been on the speed for a long time as a I, so we've competed with each other, and I always sort of uh, look fearfully at her Twitter timeline and see what she's pushing out to see if there's a major story that I missed. Julie started working uh, uh, in journalism for the Baltimore Sun. She worked there for 10 years and worked her way up the ladder the old fashioned way, doing local news and eventually doing some state politics and uh, went from there to Bloomberg, right? Mm -hmm. Covering where she became sort of a specialist in money and politics, mm -hmm. uh, working with one of my former editors, a favorite uh, Gene Cummings and then uh, went on to the Associated Press, where she did the same thing and is now doing the same thing at the Wall Street Journal, covering both campaign finance and also doing some great lobbying stories. Uh, so with that, I'll let her take it away. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming to our Money in Politics panel. If I, if I could plug Money in Politics to everyone in the lands, I think it is a great way to have a career as a political reporter because there just really aren't enough reporters out there looking at money and how money influences politics and policy. So if you can um, not get scared off by looking at documents, diving through numbers, you can really carve out a great beat for yourself. I th I've covered this now for eight years. Um, this will be my third presidential cycle. And it really never gets old because there's always something new. Like Sheila said, now we're sort of into gray money. Who would have even thought of that a couple of cycles ago? And I'm also kind of enjoying this small donor trend that we have now. It gives us something new to write about um, instead of just tracking down millionaires and billionaires, as Bernie Sanders would say. It's a kind of an interesting counterpoint to the big money story. And also some, some good fact-checking opportunities because there's a lot of spin that goes on Absolutely. with the way that these campaigns will frame you know, how much money they've raised from small donors in sometimes, frankly, like quite misleading ways. Uh, and it takes someone who's savvy like, like Julie or you know, any number of these other reporters at other publications to point out actually what this candidate just claimed about how much money they, or how many donations, one of the most misleading ways, yeah. how many donations they raised from, uh, of $200 or less. Well, you could get like a million donations of $1 and have one, two of these exactly. major donors max out and give more than the million donors, so anyway. Yeah. Um, just very quickly, a couple simple definitions because it's good to know what you're talking about here. Um, PACs, you hear that a lot in money and politics, it's political action committees. All of the candidates at the federal level register PACs, that's their principal campaign um, account. And this cycle, the federal limit is $2,800 per election. And this will become important on Monday because you'll see some candidates in the presidential race will have already gone ahead and raised the full $5,600 that they can use both for the primary and rather optimistically for the general election as well. So it's just good to know kind of the, the parameters of what you're looking at in the reports. Super PACs, we hear this all the time. It's independent expenditure committees that have no contribution limits whatsoever. Um, if you feel like it, you can give them a million dollars and then they can turn around and spend that money backing a candidate of their choice or many candidates. Um, they are not supposed to directly interact with candidates, but that line has gotten fuzzier and fuzzier over the past decade and is virtually non-existent. I remember the first cycle after Citizens United, we all did all these stories on like trying to untangle who's really behind the super PAC and is the candidate, you know, 
showing up at fundraising events and it would be sort of a gotcha story. Now they're just sort of openly doing it. So it's interesting to see how the line sort of slips farther and farther back each cycle. Um, and then just kind of a, a note here, super PACs were not created by Citizens United. Uh, they came to us courtesy of a few really important court decisions, Citizens United among them, but Speech Now, and also some federal rules changes. So just kind of be careful how you word it. It's, it's kind of a, a nails on chalkboard to hear people say Citizens United as shorthand for the reason we have big money in politics here. Um, so I wanted to just kind of highlight a couple of ways that you can write great stories off of the money beat. Or even if you're not on the money beat, just taking a look at some of these FEC filings and other data. Um, I'm gonna quickly walk through them and then we'll show a couple of the stories in a second here. Um, so obviously browse donors for patterns by family, maybe lots of family members are giving to candidates, the, own, the, the candidate's own family, for example, that could be an interesting story. Or just you know, groups of you know, wealthy members of the same family kind of pooling together to essentially circumvent donation levels that individuals have by you know, everyone and their brother giving to the same candidate. Geography is always an interesting one. Um, you've got, this came up in uh, Beto O'Rourke's race, you know, looking at like, well, actually is, he's running for Texas Senate, but how much of this money is coming in from, you know, the coastal elites? Those can be good stories to write. Industry, of course, is another great one to take a look at. Um, you know, what interest, industries are interested in which candidates. And actually a little plug for the FEC here, it's gotten quite good in the past couple of years. I, I sometimes like to praise them on Twitter because everyone's very mm -hmm. down on bureaucracy, but I don't know if you have the same experience. I, when I started on this beat, it was just basically unusable. Um, but now you can parse the data right on the FEC site in a lot of different ways. It's not necessarily real time. So on Monday, you won't be able to click through and find out exactly how much money Senator Harris has raised from which states, but it sort of flows in over the couple days and weeks after the reports are filed. Definitely play around with it. You can find some interesting stuff there. Um, big donors can be interesting stories in, in and of themselves. We'll take a look at one in a second. Um, just a note here, overarching note, people don't drop out of races because they want to. They always drop out because they run out of money or they're about to run out of money. Um, so watching the money is critically important for whatever candidate you're following. Seeing what their fundraising trends are, how much money they're spending is very important. And then also just some good stories here in how the candidate is raising money, you know, from lobbyists, from corporate PACs are sort of the, the it thing to trash these days. And then small donors, of course, are a big story. If we want to just kind of quickly take a look at a couple things here, just, you know, just showing you this is the type of data that you can see on the FEC site. I mentioned the Texas Senate race. It gives you a nice overall of, you know, the total incoming that the candidates have, how much they're spending, how much cash on hand. And then, you know, as you kind of play with the site, you can pull up you know, geographic differences and even buckets of small donations versus larger donations, which has been totally fascinating. And next on, um, just this is a great example by one of Ken's colleagues, Nick Confessori at the Times. One of my favorite money and politics <coughs> stories that I've read in the past couple of years, really drilling down on one of the most influential donors in a particular state. Um, who is this person? Why is this person giving money? You can really develop some great profiles of donors this way. You know, if you think about, you know, let's say you live in Minnesota, who is the top political donor in Minnesota on a federal level and just kind of find data through open secrets or through the FEC site or both and uh, perhaps that person is has been flying below the radar and you've got yourself a great story. Um, another story that was kind of a fun one to write here is just using data to show what we had all sort of thought of as anecdotally a trend in the 2018 race. Um, I wanted to 
come up with a data set that would either prove or disprove this theory that small donations were flowing in like mad to Democrats but not to Republicans. And so I looked at um, toss-up races in the Cook political report and just took that toss-up race set towards the end of midterms here and looked at each candidate in the identified toss-up races and found using data what people had been talking about as an overall trend. And it's, this is why I love the money beat. You can, sh you can talk to people, you can talk to pundits and politicians and voters, but then you also have data to back you up. So these are very solid stories to write and it, you, know, you can never go wrong citing data and stories. FTC and then, reports don't lie, sources do. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so on the next, oh, that's me. Okay, so then there's the flip side, the outgoing money. You raise money and then of course you turn around and spend it if, whether you're a super PAC or you're a candidate. And these are some extremely fun stories to write because you can often find waste, fraud, and abuse. And it's, it's a set of data that not a lot of reporters are looking at. And so you can really sort of find some unusual stories that aren't getting a lot of coverage. And again, let me just kind of quickly walk through these before I show them on the screen here. You look for unusual patterns of spending, in the, particularly in the campaign reports, because the super PACs are sort of accountable to no one, which is why they're a problem. Um, but the, cam the campaigns are accountable to the candidate. It's totally fair to hold a candidate responsible for the type of spending that's going on in their campaign. And these are people who want to be stewards of public money. So it's, it's a great sort of first look at how they would organize uh, financial um, spending on the government side, looking at their campaigns. Is this campaign a family and friends plan? That's always fun. You know, of course, you know, there's the incoming family and friends, but there's also looking at uh, Donald Trump's family comes to mind. Um, President Trump's campaign spent quite a bit of money on uh, his own businesses. Always an interesting story to tell, particularly when you start thinking about bottled water and other sort of obscure parts of the Trump empire. Um, looking at spending can reveal campaign tactics. Some of the candidates are really heavily investing in digital. Some of them are really heavily investing in old school things like direct mail, which is usually used to fundraise even more. And then just kind of, uh, Ken will talk about this more fully in a second here, but when you look at the spending and fundraising sides, always keep in mind, what are, you <coughs> what are you really seeing here? Is there more that you can dig into? You know, you may see an LLC pop up in a super PAC report as a donor. What is the LLC? Is there actually just a person behind it? Um, let me just show a couple of these stories real quick before I turn it over to, to Ken. Um, this was a really fun one to write because Ben Carson, um, he spent so much money on consultants that really seemed to be just sort of uh, using him as a, a way to quickly make a lot of money and not very much money actually getting out there and meeting voters. You know, when you're spending all of or most of your campaign money on media consultants, on um, digital consultants, on advertising consultants, it, it really sort of shows something about how seriously you're trying to win votes. And then on the next one, um, this is a Ken story, really fun, one of the earliest looks at the Trump campaign actually turning around and spending money on the Trump empire, which was interesting in the context of, at first, of course, he was self-funding, but he was also using his campaign to essentially return some of the money to his own pockets, a fun one to, to think through. And then lastly, on the uh, dark or gray money side, I think there's just one more. Oh yeah, no, sorry. So this, this was one I did in the mid, I, I did this recently actually on um, looking in filing reports. If, if you start seeing the same vendor over and over among across a lot of candidates, it can be fun to figure out like what is this vendor offering that's new. And in this case, it was an organizing tool that's um, for Democrats only. And it's supposed to mimic Act Blue, which has become a really powerful fundraising tool. So this is taking essentially what Act Blue does for fundraising and turning it into like a volunteer database for Democrats. Um, final slide here is just, again, 
the dark and gray money is really where your great investigative stories are, which is, has really become a specialty of Ken's here. Um, I think the way Jeb Bush ran his presidential bid was so telling and so interesting because he really hit on a lot of different things. Um, he wasn't particularly great at the campaign fundraising, but he had lots of um, super PAC help. There was, a, of course, a super PAC set up specifically to help him. And in this story, Kerry was looking at... And a dark money group. Right? Yeah, and a dark money group. Kerry was looking at how the dark money group was transferring money to the super PAC, and also how the super PAC, which is the disclosing entity, was actually raising all this money from LLCs that were meaningless. You know, people had no idea what these LLCs were. So those, again, are great investigative stories to do off the money beat. And with that, I will turn it over to Ken, who can tell you more about dark and gray money. All right. Um, yeah, so actually that uh, Jeb Bush uh, arrangement resulted in a huge fine just recently by the Federal Election Commission, which is not known for being an aggressive enforcer of these laws, uh, but in fact something that uh, I believe was like a foreign money thing with mm -hmm. Jeb Bush, right, was, was so egregious that even the FEC couldn't turn the other cheek and ended up finding it a bunch of money. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, it, it's like sort of odd to think about that that, that was, you know, just three short years ago when all these candidates were sort of openly embracing these, these big money vehicles, whether they were super PACs or dark money uh, organizations, and the fundraising into them to sort of prove their viability. They were, they were touting like how much money they had raised into these super PACs, uh, how many big donors and big donor endorsements they have, and things have turned just 180 degrees. I mean, they were even turning by the general election when you, or even, even in the primary, where you had sort of a backlash to this big money fundraising um, you know, culture, where you had candidates on either sides, Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side, and Donald Trump, interestingly, sort of now it seems ironic, on the Republican side, who ran their campaigns against money in politics, and particularly against big money in politics. And Bernie Sanders, I mean, in some ways he deserves credit. He really like revolutionized campaign fundraising with his $27 average donation, mm -hmm. as uh, mocked by Larry David on, uh, on SNL, um, to the point where now you have all the candidates on the left emphasizing their small donor fundraising, and even uh, on the right, even, even Donald Trump, despite the fact that he is now, after having run against big money, is now openly courting these major donors. I'm going to read you a, uh, an email that his, his uh, team was like trying to get me to write a story just yesterday saying that 98.7, so they haven't released their uh, FEC um, reports yet, which are due on, on Monday. Uh, by midnight when met most of the campaigns that have something to hide will file at 11.59 and 59 seconds keeping you waiting so that you can't you know, get a maximum sort of Twitter, Twitter bang for your buck and your stories will get potentially less readership uh, if they have bad news that they're trying to hide. But anyway, what you have in the run up to that, typically you'll have all these campaigns sort of voluntarily releasing aspects like just cherry picking pieces of their reports or like bits of data that they think tell a positive picture. And so this is something you have to be very much on alert for. And over the past couple of weeks, we've seen a real fight on Twitter between the surrogates for the Democratic campaigns about, about their small donor fundraising figures and voluntarily releasing figures that cannot ever be proved. Like they'll say like, you know, uh, there were X number of donations under $250. Oh, well, like $250 is not what the FEC has, but they'll think that they can get like a bigger or more compelling number by releasing that. So the Trump folks wanted me to write a story or wanted someone at the Times to write a story that 98.79% of their donations in the first quarter were from small donors defined as $200 or less. So like that doesn't, that doesn't tell you how much money came in from small donations. That doesn't even tell you how many like small donors they had, particularly now when you have the campaigns really working hard to goose their small uh, donor numbers. They will, they, they will set up donors in like recurring donations. So someone will give 10 months automatically, uh, sorry, $10 automatically deducted from their credit card like every month or every week or every two weeks. And so they'll count that as like five donations in the first quarter mm -hmm. under $200 when it's really just one donor 
who might end up by the end of the quarter being not a small donor because mm -hmm. if you add up all those donations, they come at it uh, $250 or, or more than $200. So just sort of something to be aware of. Um, but also I think there is a legitimate uh, change that's worth monitoring and, and trend that we do see particularly on the left, but also on the right, like an acknowledgement that small dollar donors are really, you know, can, if, if like um, sort of harnessed properly, be like a sustainable source of revenue in a way that some of these big donors are not. I mean, a big donor get, maxes out to the campaign. Like Julie said, some of the Democrats are already raising uh, maximum donations, including the maximum $2,800 for the primary and the maximum $2,800 for the general. Well that person cannot give again. So mm -hmm. like you get a big number up front and then if all you have is big donors and you've plucked that early, that big fruit early on, that low hanging fruit, then you're kind of like left like what, what's next? And so that's why you see so much emphasis on small dollar, small dollar donors and also so much money spent to raise these small dollar donations. So it, it's true that like if you have an organic grassroots groundswell behind a candidate who attracts a lot of small dollar donations that it's a much more cost effective way to raise money because you just you know hang out your shingle online you put up a website or you use act blue which is this great uh, aggregator that uh, uh, Julie referred to or Julie has written about and as, as a major advantage for Democrats um, and you don't have to spend all this money on fundraisers and renting out the venues and getting a caterer that's going to be up to snuff for like some of these wealthy folks who, who aren't going to eat like, you know, uh, McDonald's, sorry, Donald Trump and his uh, Oval Office uh, ceremonies with McDonald's. That's not going to cut it for, for, um, uh, for some of these major donors. So like ideally it could be, you know, there is a benefit both rhetorically to small dollar donations to be able to say, I have all this support from all these people and they're regular mom and pop folks, they're not major donors, they support my campaign, that says that my campaign has energy that will translate to votes. You know, if a donor is good, if someone gives, if someone who's not very wealthy gives you money, they're likely signaling that they're gonna vote for you and maybe even organize. And they're also giving you their data so that you can reach out to them and mobilize them. Uh, but that said, there, it's not, it's not cheap to, to, to sort of develop that small dollar donor base. So we look in the, uh, in the FEC reports at some of the expenditures that, are, that sort of show um, you know, how these campaigns are working to cultivate small donors, whether they're renting lists, email lists, or now we see a lot text message lists from other, uh, other you know, campaigns or from the party if they're getting a transfer or from, uh, you know, even from like corporations. There are corporations that will like sell your data to these campaigns. And so it's possible that you can, you know, raise a ton of money from small donors, but basically spend it all, spend all that money on the front end just trying to get these donors on board. So that's one of the reasons why we focus a lot when we do these sort of horse race type stories on what we call the burn rate, which is like how much money you're spending to raise the money that you brought in. And also why we focus on cash on hand, like how much money mm -hmm. a given campaign has. Like you can post a huge number. Bernie Sanders raised, I think like 15 or $16 million in the first quarter. Now Bernie Sanders is actually a good example of someone who does a good job, you know, cultivating in a cost effective manner some of these, uh, you know, his, his small donor base. But some of these other candidates who haven't run nationally before, It'll be interesting to see, you know, even if they posted a big number, how much they have left in the bank at the end of the first quarter. That will give you a little bit of a sense as to how they're running their campaign and whether they really do have like a sustainable stream of small dollar donations or are just sort of using the tricks to uh, to really juice their numbers, uh, you know, in the first uh, in the first report. So. That's just a sort of the, the horse race perspective. But I do think some of the best stories, as, as uh, Julie alluded to, are found in the nitty gritty of the numbers. Uh, you know, the, the big picture probably on like a, on, uh, you know, the campaign uh, on, on the FEC deadline day, you're not gonna be able to get too deeply into the actual donations or the expenditures beyond maybe broad brush strokes 
uh, broad brushstroke sort of uh, you know characterizations of how much is being spent on what, but like in the in the next days to really like go through the reports and look at donors, look at vendors, and like these donors and the vendors can be like amazing sources for you. You'll find like particularly, I think the last panel was talking about this, like the campaign consultants aren't gonna tell you anything because it's not, it's, it, it, in fact, it's in their interest to withhold information, but because they don't wanna look like they are like getting out in front of, uh, of the campaign and also because, uh, you know, they're, they're not gonna give you information that's like damaging to the, to the campaign. They're not gonna reveal something that's like problematic about the campaign. I'm sorry, I should've said the, the staff of the campaign, but the consultants might, particularly you see consultants who develop rivalries either among the consultants on a given campaign where they're like vying for the candidate's ear and trying to like win, you know, get their strategy to be ad uh, adapted, adopted by the campaign and see another, uh, another consultant as like ascendant or or another consultant as making more money than they are for like similar services, whether it's polling or direct mail or something, and just call them up, be like off the record. You know, I just wanted to know like, why is that other consultant who does the same thing that you are making so much more money, you know? And you'll this find- This is a that, very Ken technique. Yeah, but, but I mean like, the, you know, it's, it's just generally, it's like sort of like common sense that there are like, uh, within any given organization, there are gonna be like dissenters and the dissenters often have like the best stories because they have a reason to tell you sort of what's going on from their perspective, if, particularly if they think that their perspective is not, you know, that their perspective, I assume they would think that their perspective is like, uh, is, um, you know, the, the, the best way to go about things. And if they think that they're being ignored. And they, as the ship is going down. Right, they start talking more example. and more. And, and same thing with the donors. The donors are like amazing sources. The donors, like, these are folks who have access to the candidate. I mean, some of them, you know, uh, I'm thinking back to 2012, Foster Free you know, mm -hmm. traveled with Rick Santorum. This is also another example of like the coordination thing that uh, was like a big gotcha in the, in the early days of Super PACs. This was a guy who had given like, I think he ended up giving like $2 million to, to Rick Santorum Super PAC, but he was like traveling with Rick Santorum in a pickup truck around Iowa as Rick Santorum was uh, really surging and posted, I think, did he end up winning the Iowa caucus? He came in like second, yeah, but then I they recounted like and he won. First or second. And so this Foster Freeze guy wants to talk all about, oh yeah, the other day at the, you know, at the uh, campaign cabinet meeting, I was, or, you know, at the drive through or whatever they were doing, I was talking with Rick and he was saying yada, yada, yada. And so, you know, these are folks who are like, sort of thrilled to be part of the, you know, they, they give, the big donors in particular, they give because like, uh, you know, they're into politics, they have an ideology, and maybe the candidate sort of comports with that or they're loyal to the candidate, but they're also political junkies and they just mm -hmm. like love talking about it and they have no obligation to be quiet. Like the candidate would never tell a major donor like, hey, you know what, thanks for your millions of dollars to my super PAC, but it would be better if you like didn't talk to the press. Yeah. That just wouldn't happen, you <laughs> yeah. know? So like these are, these are chatty folks who are like political junkies and are like real insiders who can give you a little bit of a flavor of uh, sort of what the campaign is doing. Um, on the vendor side, not necessarily like developing as sources, but like I think some of the most, some of the best stories come when you actually like are, you're not covering necessarily like just campaign finance, you're covering the campaign at like in real time on the road for some of you, uh, but you're also like, you, you can also like access the and, and utilize the the campaign finance data to sort of explain some of the things that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So I'll give an example of Trump in 2016. You know he was having these like crazy rallies and they were getting rowdy and he had he had these guys these like plain clothes former police officers in the uh, in the crowd who would like yank you know angry protesters or people who are protesting out of the arena sometimes like you you know using like fairly aggressive tactics. And so, you know, I went through the FEC reports and I saw a bunch of payments to, for security to these guys and I started like matching the names and the reports with these guys and you know, you travel with them so you would see them a lot and told like a few stories about how uh, these guys were, you know, using the FEC reports but also what, what I was just seeing in real time. These guys were like profiling, they were like his advanced security team and they would go to cities like before he would hold a rally and they were like trying to profile protesters or potential protesters so they could refuse them entry to the arena and it was a little bit of like a private security force type of thing and these guys like I said used some aggressive tactics that ended up 
yielding a bunch of lawsuits. And so it's just an interesting sort of, you know, behind the scenes story of a campaign. And even when he got, and you know, it also like, it also like told people um, like something about what they were seeing that was sort of interesting and new and unique and maybe like to some people offensive that, mm -hmm. You know, Trump was like, call, would like call out protests or like get that guy out of here, and then like suddenly they'd be like getting dragged out. And so this is like how how and why mm. is this happening? Or another another one that comes to mind on the campaign trail was, you know, if you if you were covering Bernie Sanders events in 2015, 2016, you might have noticed that lots of people wearing red shirts were always at his right. events. And just think to yourself, like, is there money behind what I'm seeing here? And that could be a great story. It turns out that was. Um, those were people associated with the National Nurses United, United yeah. for Patient Protection, a super PAC that was going along to each Bernie Sanders event and filling in, not, I mean, not that he needed help filling crowds, but they were very vocal and visual presence there. And there were some interesting stories to tell about a super PAC that was helping Bernie Sanders as he was saying he wasn't taking super PAC help. And that, I think, will be a major dynamic as well in 2016, as so many of these Democratic candidates are like for swearing, voluntarily for swearing either super PACs or you know corporate PAC donations, which I was noticing in one of Sheila's slides. I mean, we sort of know this, but like corporate PACs are never major funders of presidential campaigns. So it's another example when a candidate comes out and says, I will not take corporate PAC money for my presidential campaign. Well, that's a good thing, because no corporate PACs are going to give you money anyway. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's sort of just um, yet another way in which having like a basic knowledge of some of this stuff, you can kind of fact check what the candidates are saying. Because I, it already, like campaign finance is, I mean, it's important to any campaign, because you know ca campaigns run on money. And when, when candidates run out of money, they drop out of the race. But it's particularly important in races like this one or in 2016, where campaign finance itself became an issue as these candidates were campaigning against the establishment and, and its various manifestations, whether that be Wall Street or major donors and their super PACs, or in Donald Trump's case, the media. It's good to know, um, you know to be able to, to, to fact check and say, actually, you know, Donald Trump, you're, you're railing against these donors, but you solicit, you like courted some of the biggest donors you know, on the Republican side in 2016 before you came out against them, like Sheldon Adelson and the Koch brothers and uh, um, Paul Singer. So anyway, I think uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so uh, it would probably be a good time to take some questions. And we have a mic over here, I think. And if you could just um, identify yourself uh, and uh, your affiliation and go ahead and fire away and make us uncomfortable with really tough questions. Interesting stories that emerged in 2016 during the primary was the case of Carly Fiorina and her super PAC, uh, Carly, C-A-R-L-Y, all capital letters. Um, and she would go to these events that were put on by her super PAC. She had no real organization in Iowa, for instance, but the super PAC had a state director and all of the staff that you would normally associate with a regular campaign. Is that something that we're going to see more of? Is that something that's going to be an ongoing trend? Is that something you're already seeing in this 2020 race? I feel like uh, that will be called out immediately by the large Democratic field. I mean, keep in mind, Donald Trump doesn't have a primary this time. And since the Democratic candidates have been so black and white on what they feel like is and is not acceptable, if you see a struggling candidate who can't fund their own campaign and then starts relying on a super PAC, um, for sure, that will not be something that lasts long because it'll be called out by the other candidates, by all of the supporters of the other candidates. I personally don't think we're going to see a lot of that, but it's a huge field, and who knows what happens once desperation kicks in. And, and I would just say I think we will see maybe not something quite so blatant like that was pretty blatant, and there were a lot of people even on, on the right who were, who were calling that out. Um, but I think we will see, like, shades of that. I mean, already... Uh, you see there's a guy, a, a donor out of San Francisco, which again has a very robust Democratic donor base and it's good to develop sources there, but there's a guy there, his name is Steve Phillips, and uh, he started a uh, pro Cory Booker super PAC and he said he's going to go to South Carolina and just you know, organize on the ground for him and maybe do ads and the mm -hmm. like. And like Booker could say, no, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want your help. And he would tell him, well, tough luck, I'm giving it to you anyway. And in fact, 
What's so interesting is he actually did that. The Steve Phillips guy in 2007 for mm -hmm. a certain candidate who was a major campaign finance reformer against big money named Barack Obama. Barack Obama really had like the first pre-Super PAC Super PAC, like candidate specific Super PAC. And it was this guy, Steve Phillips, again in South Carolina, spending a lot of money. And Obama like came out and like gave like a public statement saying, we do not accept this guy's support. He had his campaign's lawyer, Bob Bauer, who became the White House counsel after Greg Craig, who just got indicted a few minutes ago. Um, and, uh, and, and he wrote a letter to Steve Phillips and said, please stop doing this and do not use our name. Like, don't use Barack Obama for president. And he did it anyway. And I think he spent like $8 million and it was helpful. I mean, that was like, you know, probably Barack Obama would have won South Carolina anyway, but there was a time at which like Hillary Clinton was competing very uh, aggressively there and had locked up a lot of the black vote. And this, this um, you know, 527 it was at the time, you know, organized black voters in a way that was super helpful to the campaign. And so I think we could see things like that that are like not quite so blatant and not quite so blessed by the candidate, but in the shadows mm -hmm. operating. So something to keep an eye on. Uh, do you want to uh, yeah. Steve Contorno, Tampa Bay Times. Uh, on the expenditure side, one thing we had in our recent governor's race was a candidate who almost all of his spending was to a single LLC, a consulting company, and then that company would subcontract out you know, all the other expenditures of a normal campaign. Um, is that sort of opacity common, or are we seeing more and more of that? Uh, is that happening at the federal level, and, and how can we as reporters get around that? Is it even legal at the federal level? I'm not even sure. American made. Yeah, yeah well, actually, the, it, it is becoming more common. And, and Julie pointed out that there's a, the Trump campaign is doing this this time as well. They, they set up an LLC, and it's actually the campaign Campaign officials set up this LLC, but it's basically within the campaign called American Made Media Consultants. And uh, the purpose of it, I mean, they say the purpose of it is to like, uh, streamline. Right, to streamline, to have more control over their advertising buying in particular, and to cut out buyers who would otherwise charge commissions because it's like inside the campaign, so they're not going to take commissions. But it does definitely have the element of, uh, of making it harder to track, and that is an advantage, undeniably an advantage for the campaign because other campaigns are, you know, campaigns are constantly checking their competitors reports, their fi financial disclosure reports, to see where they're spending their money, who's doing the buying, to try to extrapolate like how much, so compare how much the buy was, you know, or sorry, how much the spend was to the, the media buyer, and how much the media, how much airtime or digital advertising time, but airtime is easier to track, was actually purchased, so then you can kind of back, go backwards and figure out what commission the mm -hmm. advertising uh, the ad buyer is taking. You can't do that when you have one of these in-house uh, ad buying firms. And this was actually uh, an innovation of Mitt Romney's in uh, 2012. Although he, they argue it was an innovation of George W. Bush oh, before okay. them. I hadn't heard so that. Okay. They had, <laughs> everyone they had built America off Rambo. each other's previous right. iterations to right. make it more and more opaque. No, but to your point about how you could find out, well, the reason why the Romney thing started to like seep out of my colleagues at the time at Politico, who are now both with me at the uh, New York Times, Maggie Haberman and Alex Burns, wrote a great story. And it was be about like sort of revealing the Romney uh, situation. And it was because there were rival ad buyers, you know, who were getting cut out of it. Back to my point about like playing consultants off each other who were pissed off and, and had some visibility into what was going on here and provided it to, you know, uh, to, to everyone once, it, once we wrote the story. So just one, like, one possible way to try to get at it, to go to figure out who's, get, who's getting the shaft here and go ask them about what's happening. Hi guys, Brian Baxter, Minnesota Public Radio News. Uh, how often are the, the first 24 hour, first 48 hour numbers pressure tested to see if they actually hold up? Because it seems like there's a lot of narrative building there. As you mentioned, there's a lot of spin in these numbers. And on the uh, output side, do candidates or, and, and campaign committees and other committees, do they self-classify or are there a set uh, list of categories that they they hit, you know, fundraising, uh, meals, whatever that they that they check off. That's a good question. I'll, I'll take the second one. So uh, there are categories, but they're not good. So CRP has broader, has uh, more granular categories, and we are actually kind of 
manually going through and saying, no, in fact, this is not a general expenditure, this is media or this is fundraising, based on what they report in their descriptions, which again can be very vague, as well as what the organization is, what we can identify about their line of work. Um, so it's, uh, you can find some of that, but I think our categories are better. It is not standardized as much as you would hope. No, it's not, and the organizations aren't standardized at all, which is what we do. So and also like hide things, they'll like classify something as like, Office supplies, you know, when it's when it's um, I don't know. Uh, Sarah Palin's wardrobe. Right. So that's a good. Yeah. That's a great example. I forget what that was. I yeah. think that was uh, that might have been something like. Well, Neiman Marcus was the giveaway. Right. 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 right, right. Um, and then uh, to your first question, yeah, I mean, you know, some of it, I, I think, like, I, I can't remember a time when a campaign like grossly misrepresented something when they voluntarily released their figures or some portion of their figures ahead of time. Uh, that could be fact-checked, although we certainly like look for that. But more, more likely, what you see, and more often, what you see is that they'll give you like some spin on like you know how much how much they raise from small donors, and you'll look and see, oh, actually, that's like entirely misleading. Like how many? That, what I was saying before, like how many donations were from small don you know were from small donors. So now we have it on record right here. I'm telling you that the Trump campaign said that they raised that 98.67 percent of their donations were from small donors. Well, let's see when the report comes in, actually, how much of their money came from unitemized donations. I guarantee you it's going to be a whole lot less than 98.67%. Yeah. And one other quick point, um, you do see some necessary stress testing on the super PAC side. Sometimes you'll get a call from a super PAC uh, director or whatever they call themselves saying, you know, hey, we're going to spend $30 million. We just raised or we've collected or some other term. $30 million. Well, then, you know, it's very important to check their next FEC filing. And you might see, actually, they have $8 million in the bank. You call the guy back up and say, what happened to the $30 million? And all of a sudden, it becomes, oh, those were pledges. They're coming. But the check isn't in the door yet. So on the bigger money side, it's really important to stick as closely as you can to FEC numbers. And speaking of estimates, um, most of you probably know this, but uh, we do show the ad buys on the FCC database so you can see uh, the time that has been reserved and the cost. And of course, that'll be amended later if, in fact, the candidate lost or they decided not to run in that state, et cetera. So what you see now may or may not actually happen. I'm Chris Gentleviso from the UNC School of Media and Journalism. My question is about the best efforts notification, the requirement for individual donors over $200 that campaigns get their address employment and occupation and how that looks in a 21st century economy where folks might not be so honest, have multiple jobs, mm -hmm. say they're retired, but maybe they're still working or even report multiple occupations to one candidate and separate donations. Yeah, I mean, I think that, okay. I was just gonna yeah. say, there's a great story here because after Securities and Investment Wall Street, the second top industry or interest group was retired. So who are these massive numbers of retired people that are funding our elections? Um, but. Yeah, you, you see great stuff. I mean, they're kind of silly stories sometimes, like Maverick or Messiah in their occupation employer information and then otherwise just left blank and filled in with best efforts. Mm -hmm. Or like self-employed, you know, people write self-employed. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily think that's like intended to uh, obfuscate, but it does certainly make it harder, uh, as she was talking about, one of, the, one of the tools that, you know, where you can like, get stories from the data is if like there are a number of people at a given law firm who are giving on a certain day like chances are there's a fundraiser at that law firm or fundraiser organized by one of that law you know one of the law firm's partners or associates or something like that and if that you know if they just list it as like lawyer or uh you know and don't and don't list the employer list occupation but not the employer that makes it harder to like tell that story john edwards had a fundraiser where it was I don't know, 10 or 20 or dozens of lawyers in Colorado who, they clearly had a fundraiser, so they were giving all this money. And all of their spouses, which I think were uniformly women, uh, were listed as civic volunteers. So in that case, they're likely filled in by the campaign. They're not even asking what their mm -hmm. employer is. Yeah. Hi, uh, Cheyenne Hazlitt with ABC News. 
Um, we're seeing a lot of trends in how candidates talk about money, be it banning PACs or um, touting small donations. What's mo most interesting, which candidates are most interesting to you guys right now, money-wise? Good question, very uh, open-ended question. Um, I am interested in the two sort of ends of the spectrum, the, the Bernie Sanders and the people who will be the Bernie Sanders of this cycle may in fact be Bernie Sanders. Um, but maybe it's Elizabeth Warren who catches on. Um, those small donations and how they hold up over time are really interesting. And then on the other side, I'm really intrigued to see how Jay Inslee and Cory Booker navigate this super PAC averse uh, group of Democrats that they're running against, because both of those guys have just explicit super PACs that are helping them. And you know, how much do they come to rely on those super PACs? That's going to be a really interesting story. And can I just add, we have three data sets you should be aware of. We list and maintain a single candidate super PAC list, so you can see how many single candidate super PACs are dedicated to Booker or Inslee, et cetera. We maintain a page of the most, the candidates who raise the most and least from small and large donors, and we'll be creating that for 2020 once uh, we have the Q1 data. And we also maintain a list of the no PAC pledges, people who have uh, disavowed PACs, corporate PACs, uh, and super PACs. And of course, that's become a controversy because uh, there are these uh, super PAC supporting candidates of color that are saying that you've, yet, you've set up yet another barrier uh, to candidates of color. This is you know, bad policy, Democrats. Hmm. I would say Elizabeth Warren, uh, because she, she doesn't really fit in either of those extremes that Julie was just talking about. And she, as you know, seemingly an effort to affiliate herself with the Bernie Sanders camp, that announced that she would voluntarily forego like fundraisers, fundraisers, period. Like mm -hmm. she would not have physical fundraisers, and uh, you know she doesn't necessarily have that huge and um, you know fervent small donor base behind her uh, in a way that that would allow her to do that. Like Bernie Sanders didn't really do fundraisers, but he didn't have to do fundraisers because he had all this. Uh, small money coming in. She doesn't have the small money coming in, and uh, she didn't post a super impressive number, at least the, the one that she voluntarily released of her uh, for her first quarter fundraising. And she does. I know of many major donors who do like her, and maybe they'll still give the max online, uh, but it, it, I think it could uh, end up you know, uh, hampering her ability to stay competitive financially uh, that, she, that she did that if she sticks to it. Can I add one more thing? Win Red it used to be called Patriot Pass. It's the right's answer to Act Blue. So the question is whether they'll be successful in mimicking the small donor money bomb that Act Blue has helped generate. Yeah. I think we have time for one more, if maybe we two, if we do it fast. Monica Alba with NBC News. I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about joint fundraising committees, and then of course there will be a lot of attention on the many Democrats in the field, but what it's like also to have an incumbent running in the race and sort of how that operation is a little bit different and what are some of the storylines to sort of watch there? Uh, can I say, I'll say joint fundraising. I mean, uh, this, this is a, a development that really uh, took off after 2014, the McCutcheon yeah, decision they, was that. They... So there, there was a Supreme Court decision that essentially eliminated the aggregate caps on like how much a given donor could give to federal candidates. Used to be like, what was it, one? 132. Right, so you could only give like a certain amount of money. So you could give the max to however many candidates, but once you hit that number, you couldn't give any more. Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. And so immediately you saw a, um, a rush by candidates to establish these joint fundraising committees that would allow them to take in like huge sums. And Hillary Clinton was really a forerunner of this. And I ended up writing a story uh, that um, uh, the reporting for that story was, was uh, ended up in the WikiLeaks batch of emails that was leaked. Julian Assange just got indicted as well while well, we're talking about indictments. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, was, it was very complicated. It was very difficult to figure out. But basically the allegation, and this is like, I say this by way of like suggesting a possible line of reporting on these joint fundraising committees is how many of the component committees that are part of a joint fundraising committee are actually getting, keeping, and controlling the money versus what you saw with the Clinton joint fundraising committees, which is the, with the subject of the story that we revealed, was that the money was like entirely controlled by the Democratic National Committee and 
they, the state parties, this was even during the primary, when she was still running against Bernie Sanders, the state parties, many, it was like 30 some state parties that were members of it, and the money would like barely hit the ground, in the, like hit the bank account in the state party, and then the DNC would just pull it back and use it as it saw fit. So you had these state parties who were like, whoa, 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 what's going on? This is supposed to be our money. You're using like our cap, you know, our, the contribution to us to raise the amount that you can take, but we're not benefiting from it. So that I think more, it was, it was very unusual that you saw it during a primary where one candidate really took advantage of and the other didn't. But mm -hmm. I don't think you'll see that. I think the DNC learned its lesson from the, uh, you know, the Bernie Sanders folks claiming that the party is sort of its thumb on the scale for Hillary. I don't think you'll see them do that, but it will be interesting to watch the way the Republicans and the Trump Joint Fundraising Committee uh, sort of disseminates the, the, the money that it raises that's, that is supposed to go to the state party. And just very quickly on the incumbency thing, Trump could not have more things going his way. He's a great small dollar fundraiser. He's probably the only solid Republican small dollar fundraiser that I can remember in the past couple cycles. So he's got that. The RNC is financially healthy and thriving, thanks in part to the small dollar fundraising that he brings in. DNC can't say that for sure. And then he's, got, he's, he's had two years to fundraise. He's got a very well-established um, financial operation. Yeah, they've spent a lot of money, but they've also been building stuff over the past two years. I think, you know, financially speaking, especially compared to his 2016 campaign, he could not have more advantages on the money side. Can we take one more quick question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Murray Weedmeyer in life, just real quick, with the field this size, are you expecting any super PACs negatively targeting candidates? And if so, would you cover those any differently than you would uh, the ones that support candidates? Oh, there will definitely be yeah. super PACs spending against. I mean, yeah. It's there. sort of like the highest and best purposes of, of a super PAC. Like it's very, the, the coordination rules, while they are sort of you know, in many ways ignored, they do make it harder to coordinate a positive message with a campaign. And so it's sort of easier and a better use of their money to instead of trying to, you know, boost the, the you know, say nice things about the candidate who they're supporting to attack that candidate's rivals. And I think you see uh, that, you know, I, the, we've seen that in, in the recent cycles of super PACs. I think you'll see that again. I think it'll way. be tremendously interesting if Bernie Sanders is the second to last person standing, how well the other Democrats or whoever's left in the race hold to their no super PACs pledge? Because I could see that getting really ugly at the end. On that cheery note, yeah. <laughs> thank you all for coming.